Can you also tell us how Katrina can be less annoying? Tell her she's pissing you off and okay. allow yourself to feel it in your body. Okay, so Katrina, you're really pissing me off and let me feel it. Hold on, in my body, in my chest. Where is it sitting in your body? Where do you feel it when you, when she pisses you off? Ooh, right here in my chest. All right. What does that mean? That's usually where anger sits for me, Oh, too. my gosh. Are yeah. you kidding me? That's usually Hold where it sits on. for me. Katrina <laughs> wants to chime in because she's been listening. You're live on... What about, what about, what about when Nessa pisses me off? Okay, where do you feel it, Katrina? I feel it in my head. I feel it in my eyes. You're live. Okay. I feel it in my, my chest. Okay, what happens if you, what happens if you put a hand on your head and a hand on your chest and then take a few deep breaths? Well, my hands are busy editing the show, so I can't really take them off. I know you're not complaining. Wait, okay, wait. So, okay. Right, I miss you. I miss, I miss you, you too, <laughs> Katrina, we're going to have definitely a part two with Amrit and we're going to have like another expert here. Like, yes, we need to. Okay. All right, Katrina, I, I will not yell at you today. I kid. Not really. What's something simple yet very effective? You know, the one thing someone can do to help manage their stress. Boundaries. Not Ooh. easy, but kind of simple. Boundaries. Like um, if you're finding yourself feel spread thin, it's most likely because there's probably some places that you're not that you're you know people pleasing or oh. which so don't get one. me started we like, <laughs> could have a whole episode on that yeah um so um so where can you where can you prioritize your mental and emotional health um you know maybe it's not having your phone in the bed with you at night maybe it's you know, oh, I'm not going to answer emails after 8 p.m. at night. Maybe right. it's seeing if you're if you're being given more work at work than what feels feasible, seeing where you can outsource if there's a possibility for that. Right. Um, I think I think looking at where you can outsource is a really great tool. Mm -hmm. It's not always easy, but um, look at where like, are you drinking a lot of alcohol? Mm -hmm. Are you because alcohol is like gasoline on a fire for people who have anxiety. The nervous system doesn't really it's oh. a it's, it's a suppressant so it actually like it's it's such a personal decision for people but a lot of people find that if they cut out alcohol things shift. really so that's a big one if you're if you're if you're if de finding you're de-stressing with alcohol it's it's actually harder it's actually probably causing more problems okay well Sorry to rain on everybody. It's great, but to say it's over. That you <laughs> Toss the alcohol out. It's not to say you shouldn't, couldn't, shouldn't, or couldn't enjoy a drink. It's just like looking, uh, getting curious about your relationship with alcohol. I yeah. think that I always tell people getting curious is really beautiful because it comes from without judgment. Mm. Because the moment you start to judge yourself, then that's when you get into the shadow and you're gonna like shut that down and you're not gonna look at where you're like, oh, maybe I have. Like maybe I am using this to cope and maybe that's not the best. What can I, what can I do to like cut it down to like one a right. week or a couple, you know? Right. Okay. We need a part two. Okay. okay so Amrit, this is a little weird because we're friends, but now I have to have a conversation <laughs> with you. And talk about all the great things that you do. It is, it, it is weird. Yeah, Because we know right? each other. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me give the formal title of what you do. Okay. So that everyone watching can understand how brilliant and how great your work is. Okay? okay. So you are a certified somatic nervous system and trauma coach and a certified herbalist. Yes, ma'am. Sounds like a lot of healing is going to happen. Okay, so tell me honestly, when we first met, did you realize I had a lot of trauma? Like, did you analyze me? Well, I've, no, I don't do that because I think that's an invasion of people's boundaries. Oh, you're so sweet. So I, I, I try not to do that. I can usually just tell when people start to talk because once I tell people, it happens two ways. Some people just like open, I'm a Scorpio. People just right. like come to me and they're like, Here's Here. all of my trauma. Can right. you help me with it? Or I'll like say what I do and they'll be like, okay, so what do I need to do when I can't sleep at night? Right. And like my mind is like, you know, going. So I think that, um, I think it was just like, I've seen your, po I've seen, I've watched your podcast oh for a couple gosh. years now. Yeah, we're um, problematic. <laughs> we have issues, Katrina and I. I, I love apologize. them. I love them. <laughs> Sorry. So like, so like I've heard you like mention things. So I'm like, okay, like, but I would say majority of people, millennials onward, 
struggle with some form of chronic anxiety at this point. Not everybody does, Mm -hmm. but a lot of people relate to the work that I do Mm -hmm. because they'll be like, oh, well, I have anxiety. Right. And it's not just like getting nervous every once in a while. It's like things that disrupt your life. Was that why you got into this? Did you have anxiety yourself? Oh, my God. Yeah. So I... I was diagnosed with CPTSD, which is complex CPTSD or PTSD uh, about five or six years ago now. I started my own. I'd already kind of been interested in it because I'd struggled with anxiety since I was little and disassociation. So I'd go between I'll talk about kind of the different nervous system states, but go between like shutdown and anxiety since I as long as I can remember. And like I'm the hugest proponent for talk therapy. I think it's necessary and helpful as long as you get the right therapist. Mm -hmm. And you can't talk your way out of anxiety and you can't talk your way out of trauma because those things live in your body and we're body up creatures. And so we have to address what's in the body and address what's in the mind. And most often the mind is actually responding to and trying to figure out and give an answer to what's going on in the body, but it's not going to be able to because the body just goes off of sensation. Wow. And so we have to get in and feel. And that's the really uncomfortable part of the work. Okay. I'm already <laughs> uncomfortable. This is going to be tough. No, I, I think this is amazing. So what exactly is a certified somatic nervous system and trauma coach? Like, what does that entail? I have So I have a bunch of different certifications that I've kind of like pieced together. Um, I recently just finished a 60-hour um, somatic trauma therapy certification that like just kind of gave me some additional tools, but validated the stuff that I've already been researching and doing. And it, it went through tons of different, there's so many different modalities. And I tell people there's not one thing that's going to work for everybody, right? but there's always going to be something that's going to work for you or multiple things that's going to work for you. And so that's kind of where I come in is to help people find what works for them, validating them because so many of us come out of environments in which we were invalidated, especially in our emotions, which emotional regulation is nervous system regulation because your emotions come from your nervous system. Mm -hmm. And so guiding people, validating them, letting them know what they've experienced is very real, teaching them how to sit. Like there's kind of a few different pillars that I work with. One is joy Mm -hmm. because joy is one of the most, like the nervous system thrives off of joy, but in order for us to have those moments of really truly embodying joy, we have to find a moment of safe enough Mm. to really Mm -hmm. fully feel it. Um, And then the other part is like discomfort. Like we are, especially as a white woman, Mm. I am very much taught to not experience discomfort. And the moment you get into that discomfort, you wanna run away from it. Mm. And that's actually that really important moment of being able to okay, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. Am I uncomfortable? Am I unsafe or am I uncomfortable? Those are two questions I ask people a lot. Are you actually unsafe or are you just uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. And 90% of the time, it's going to be that you're uncomfortable. And so my journey has also been integrating this work that I do with my own anti-racism and decolonization journey, Mm -hmm. because even the field that I work in Mm -hmm. is very has been problematic and so really how yeah like i mean psychology is rooted in white supremacy Mm -hmm. (laughs) in this country Mm -hmm. right so even like certain mental illnesses and things like that not saying that they're not very real and we don't have to address them but a lot of the the way i'm going to be treated going in for a mental health and the way somebody in a darker body is going to be treated going in for mental health is going to be two different things And so I want to be aware of that Mm -hmm. and I want to deconstruct and look at that differently from my point of view. So I, I very much integrate that into the work that I do and help people to like learn to sit with the discomfort Mm -hmm. because anti-racism work is also trauma Mm -hmm. work. And if you can learn to sit with the discomfort and get curious about it, I always say the nervous system thrives off of curiosity. Mm -hmm. So if you can just get Curious of like, okay, I'm feeling something. I just read something in a book and I'm feeling this big reaction in my body. Like, where is it sitting? Mm -hmm. What does it feel like? Giving it a physical name. Is it tight? Is it expansive? Is it sharp? Burning? Breathe with it. What happens if I just get curious about what it means? It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It doesn't mean X, Y, Z. 
and you just sit with it and you breathe through it, you can eventually kind of like move through it and help it to integrate mm-hmm. and deconstruct it rather than reacting to it and mm-hmm. shutting it down, which is what we're taught to do. So when you feel that tightness in your chest or whatever, are there d- different feelings that correlate with different things? Every, yes. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. okay, if you feel something in your chest or if you feel something in your stomach or if you feel something, I don't know, in your head. Sometimes people feel hand, like tingling in their hands is yeah, how anxiety will manifest. It's just your nervous system's responding and that's how your nervous system is like, that's how your body's talking to you, telling you that you are in that sympathetic state. So like for me, my anxiety usually um, like manifests as kind of like, upset like butterflies in the stomach, Mm. tight chest. Sometimes I'll feel it in my throat. Um, And so that's an indicator to me. And what I tell people is we're taught to get to be afraid of our anxiety. And your anxiety is like I often relate to your nervous system as your inner child because your, your nervous system is a blueprint of your life. We actually we don't we experience the world through our nervous system. Mm. And so that's why like things like PTSD and CPTSD, if people experience something that feels similar, they feel like they're actually in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's like a trigger of what we talk about, right? And so if you can rewire that moment, and uh, one of my favorite trauma therapists, his name is Resma Menicum, he wrote uh, My Grandmother's Hands, um, which is actually a trauma and anti-racism book. It's phenomenal. He talks about uh, metabolizing Mm -hmm. our trauma. And that's like a big part of what happens to where we end up with a dysregulated nervous system. Chronic anxiety, chronic depression is that that trauma doesn't get metabolized. And so it just kind of like sits undigested. Ouch. And then it hurts. (laughs) And then it hurts. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Exactly. So tell me a little bit about your training, you know, because I think. For a lot of us who don't know what's how to even approach this, mm-hmm. right? Like, how do I take care of my well-being? I hear about it all the time, mental health. But, like, what does that mean to mm-hmm. take care of it, to cater to our nervous system? How do mm-hmm. we sit in our discomfort? So what were the different trainings that you went through to get you to this point where you are a coach and yeah. you do help people? Yeah. Um, so I grew up doing meditation and yoga. So that was kind of, like, my basis for understanding the importance of the somatic, the soma, the body. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went through a like coaching certification, which like, I don't really give much like credit to that, but then I've done multitude like trauma informed trainings, somatic movement trainings, um, like somatic therapy trainings, Mm -hmm. uh, like just, I probably have done like, I'm constantly wanting to keep learning and keep like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) keep adding to my toolkit. So, um, yeah, I would say over the last six, five or six years, I've probably done 10 different trainings. Wow. Um, And so I find what works. And I, you know, I know, I also know that things that work for me might not work for my clients. And so I like to teach things that even, even though that might not work for me, a client might really find like safety in that tool and, and peace in that tool. And so I'll share all sorts of different things with people. What's your favorite training? Mm. I really love polyvagal theory. Oh, what's this? So Sounds complicated. Yeah, it, it does. So your vagus nerve, this is actually wh- where I originally went viral was I posted a TikTok. <laughs> this is actually how my friend and I met. Um, I posted a TikTok of placing a ice pack on your chest to stop an anxiety and panic attack. It's so effective. Really? Because what it does is your vagus nerve is the nerve, it's, a, it's the 10th cranial nerve and it stems from your brainstem and goes splits in two and goes all the way down and uh, wraps around your small intestine. So it's the longest cranial nerve wow. in the body. And it controls 80-ish percent of your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the um, the rest and digest state. And so when you, it responds to cold is one of the ways to stimulate it and cold stimulates it quite quickly. So an ice pack on your chest or the back of your neck will stimulate the vagus nerve when you're having a panic attack and help to bring you back to a baseline. And it's, it's effective. Mm. <laughs> And so polyvagal theory is the, like, it's basically like the theory of safety. So um, there's three, there's a hierarchy of the nervous system. So you have the ventral vagal state, which is safety and connection. And then you have sympathetic, which is 
uh, fight or flight or like anxiety, but it's also um, like action movement. Um, and then you have the second part of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is called dorsal vagal. Mm -hmm. And that is where like if you get stuck in dorsal vagal, they call it dorsal vagal shutdown. That's where like disassociation and depression mm -hmm. and all that comes from. And so oftentimes people will bounce back and forth between anxiety and depression or between shutdown and anxiety because in order to come back up to ventral vagal, you have to finish the stress cycle. So your body actually has to finish, come up Whoa. to an arc and come back down. And the reason that a lot of people live with chronic anxiety is because something happened in their life, either a one-time thing or an extended thing, where it took them into one of those states and they're, in order for their body to keep them safe, it, it was unable to finish that stress cycle and come back to safety. So they kind of got stuck there. And so it's called coming outside of your window of tolerance. And, um, and so that creates more of a, for lack of better words, sensitivity in the nervous system to become more sensitive to discomfort. Um, and so what I, like the, the core of what I do is teach people how to create resiliency, flexibility, and adaptability in their nervous system. So you wanna kinda like push up against those discomforts do things that you think you can't do, come out on the other side, finish that stress cycle, and that will actually create more resilience in the nervous system and help you to be able to tolerate more discomfort. So I have a question, do you help children? I have, yes, I actually work with some teens. Oh, but teens. I have, yeah, but I have worked with kids before. So how does that look like? So it's, you do like, so one of my favorite things for kids is like the birthday candle tool. So if your kid is like feeling, like say, Baby caps having like a meltdown, right? And um, yes, sorry, <laughs> yeah. And and like you're because kids, what will happen is like if they get like triggered to a, you know, they'll get themselves so hyped up they cannot bring themselves back down. I've seen this. <laughs> yes, like they just can't. And so co-regulation we learn before we learn self-regulation. Okay, so what we, is that? Break that down. Co-regulation is like. You know when um, when baby cap is like fussing and you'll maybe like bounce sway. and yeah. sway, right? And maybe you'll hum, right? All of those things. Humming stimulates the vagus nerve. This oh. is like bilateral stimulation, so it's balancing the right and left like sides of the brain and and bringing it into the present moment in the body. So in case someone's not watching, what Amrit just did right now is like as if you're you know like patting a baby on the yes. back. Like, yeah, you know, I'm, so, I'm gentle. Not saying what I'm doing, I'm just. Like, People watching us are gonna think you're funny. Hey, what is she doing? <laughs> but you're like, you know, gently patting a baby on yeah. its back. Yeah. yeah. So that is you teaching, and maybe you're like regulating your breathing. Mm -hmm. And so that's you teaching how to regulate. And so some people don't learn that at a young age because they didn't have the safety of those things. And so um, it's never too late to learn, but co-regulation happens usually before self-regulation. Okay, so co let me understand. Co-regulation- Is like two people. Two people. Yeah. So a parent soothing their child, yeah. be it swaying them back and mm -hmm. forth, humming mm -hmm. or gently patting them on the mm -hmm. back. Okay, so that's- mm -hmm. That's co a co-regulation. Got it, yeah. okay. So one thing that works really well for kids who are probably like two and up is the birthday candle trick. Okay, so we're gonna tell Katrina this for Amara. Yes, okay. yeah, so. it's perfect for Amara. So if she, if she's like freaking out and you're like, okay, let's blow out the birthday candles. We're gonna take a deep breath. <sighs> First birthday candle, second birthday candle. And so the safest way to teach the body that you're safe is actually to take a deep breath because the exhale is what the nervous system responds to as safety. And so it teaches them to regulate their breath. It lets them kind of like catch their breath for a moment. It brings them to the present moment to like focus on something fun. You can do zoo animals too, like take a deep inhale and then make a zoo animal sound on the right. way out. But your breath is one of your like most basic powerful tools when it comes to anxiety because it's the first thing that usually goes. Interesting. Okay, so when someone does that, are they supposed to breathe in and out four times to blow out the candles or or is it at once? One, four times. Four times, okay, yeah. so, okay. Or three times or like however old they, like maybe like if they're three, you do three. three. Like Got or it. as long as they need it for. Right. Um, and the other thing too you can do too is like put on some music and shake it out with your kids. Because I've seen that, you shake it out yeah, on I, your Instagram. You know, I'm always shaking it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's like really, truly. So the tools that you're gonna use are gonna be different for 
if you're in a sympathetic state than if you're in shutdown. So if, because there's a hierarchy, so dorsal vagal is down here and then you have sympathetic and then you have um, the ventral vagal. And there's also blended states. So like when we're like, like we went to Universal Studios yesterday. So when you're like having fun, you are going between sympathetic and that like ventral vagal state of connection. But we have this thing called like a, a break. And like, so your body's like, oh, we're not actually in danger. So we're gonna bounce back and forth between these two things. But some people would don't have that ability to do that because they are dysregulated. And so we have to reteach that. And you do that really slow. So like if you're in, if you're anxious, you want to do something. I always say that anxious bodies need action. Don't meditate if you're anxious. It's not going to work. It's probably going to actually make it worse. Why? Um, because, because the anxiety is a chaotic, frantic energy, and it needs a little bit of chaotic, frantic energy or something to shock the system out of it to help finish that stress cycle. And so, like, shaking it out is amazing if you're super anxious. The ice pack is great because it's a shocking thing. You mm -hmm. can also bite into a lemon or, like, a really sour candy can be helpful. Um, like going for like a rigorous walk for at least 15 minutes. The stress cycle is usually about 15 minutes ish. Right. Um, if you're in shutdown, like if you're feeling numb, disassociated, kind of like lack of interest in things, it's more gentle movements. Like a lot of people like yin yoga. That's where you can do more of the like slower pranayama breath work things. Journaling, people find that actually helpful because it is a form of movement and you're kind of getting your thoughts mm -hmm. out on paper. A, a walk again is really great. So some of them work for both and you can use acute tools for when you're not in an acute state, but you can't use like the tools that are meant for like mild state for the acute because they just won't be enough to get you out of that. I think I remember you left a comment when I had posted a clip when I was talking to the parent coach, Maria Sanders, and she was saying like, you know, if you're just in an, going through being overwhelmed, your kids are just, you know, driving you up the wall and you just need to relax and calm down and kind of get centered again. She was like, yeah, just go ahead and put your head in the freezer. Yeah, or hands under cold water. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. and I remember that because you said... Oh, yeah, because it's going to regulate the vagus. Yeah, it's going to stimulate the vagus nerve. There it is. Yeah, and that's like, I'm a doctor now. We I'm kidding. We're not doctors. <laughs> We're not doctors. We, we are, are not, not doctors. doctors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no, cold therapy is, is or cold exposure is a really great way to help to like, like doing like a cold um, shot at the end of the shower is a great way to help tone your nervous system. And like, because... Initially, you're like shocked, right? But then you do breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth and you're like, okay, I'm okay. Like, it's kind of like walking yourself through like, we're safe, we're okay. Like, this is okay. Mm -hmm. And each time you do that, it creates just a little bit more of that resiliency in the nervous system. Got it. Okay. So how would you define trauma in the work that you do? So there's lots of different types of trauma and everybody has have, some people have more than others, but everybody has experienced some form of trauma in their life. Right. I would say what resonates more f most for me is when you went into a state of unsafe, when you were unsafe at one point or felt unsafe and weren't able to find your way back to safety. Because it's really like trauma is really a, a moment of like being unsafe. Mm -hmm. the, the research has shown that the after effects of trauma, so not everybody who experiences trauma ends up with PTSD. Mm -hmm. It could be that they, it's just who they are, their lived experience, they find their way back. But a lot of it is resourcing afterwards. Mm -hmm. So if you have the right resources afterwards, you have a safe person to talk to, you have a way to expel the energy from your body. Um, I love I love to use the analogy of if you've ever watched like uh, a nature show where like a tiger or a lion's like chasing a gazelle and, and the gazelle gets away and you'll see it kind of go off by itself and it'll shake. It's oh. shaking the trauma off of its body. It's <gasps> finishing the stress cycle. So it, watching animals is actually like a really beautiful way to see wow. like the inherent nature of the nervous system because it literally will go off by itself or it'll like kind of antagonize a few. Other, it's, it's literally trying to shake that trauma off of its body. Wow. Yeah. I know. It's like... <laughs> It's so cool. That is so cool. <laughs> so like the resources and what happens after matters. Wow. Okay. So what does, I guess, success when it comes to the work that mm. you do look like? Somebody is recovering. They're trying yeah. to get through their trauma. What does success ultimately look like for them? I can tell you for myself. 
Okay. Success or for a client. Success for me is when you are able to identify the first moments of feeling dysregulated, um, honor that because we kind of gaslight ourselves of yes. like, oh, I'm not feeling that. Well, no, you're very much, your body's feeling it. So just admit that you're feeling it. We, we play, and this is kind of where I get into like so much of this is like, I say white supremacy depends on our dysregulation because it depends on our dysregulation. Because wow. when you're in dysregulation, your sole purpose is survival. Damn. And so if you look like, of Damn. course, like, Damn. <laughs> of course, it's going to create, we have the system that keeps us very dysregulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you look at different bodies and different experiences, it's going to be on different levels of those. The nervous system, its sole purpose is to keep you alive and safe. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people, because people get so angry at their bodies for like, why am I depressed all the time? Why am I anxious all the time? Like not like I'm literally just like sitting in a room and I feel like I'm running for my dear life. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's because your, your nervous system, like your mind thinks that if, if it can figure out the why, then it can resolve it. And that's why I say you can't think yourself out of trauma because mm -hmm. you have to feel yourself out of it. And uh. that's really, can I cuss? Yes. That's really painful. Right. Well, what do we feel? Can you explain, like, can you paint the picture of what you're saying? Like, we're, we have to feel it. Yeah. What does that mean? Somebody once said that, like, healing trauma is allowing yourself to feel what you what you were actually feeling in the moment that something happened that you couldn't feel because you had, because we shut down or we go into like these states. And so that's why it's so painful because you're having to look at little you mm -hmm. or whatever version of you was hurt and, and hold space for that. Right. And that's really hard. So feel, so for me, like we always want to like intellectualize our emotions. Absolutely. Right. Cause like, of, of course. course. <laughs> yeah. Duh. But, Here we are. But like that doesn't do like right. you have to feel them. So the way um, there was a brain scientist from, I believe, Stanford who said that the lifespan of an emotion is 90 seconds. So if you oh. can just sit and notice for 90 seconds, you can finish that emo an emotional lifespan and move on. And the thing is, is like we feel so many different things all at once. So it's not necessarily realistic to like every moment be like, okay, what am I feeling right, right now, right? But in the moments when you feel those more intense emotions, like for me, I'm getting better, but like anger's always been a little bit hard for me. And so like I can identify, okay, my jaw is tight. My throat is kind of tight. My chest feels like there's like a fire raging in it. Okay, I'm gonna sit with it. I'm gonna like identify what it feels like. I'm gonna give it like a name. I'm going to breathe. And then I always like for more intense motions, I say, do something to dispel the energy. Go for mm -hmm. a walk, shake, scream. I, I'm a I'm a big fan of a primal scream. Really? Oh, God, I love it. Into a pillow. Do your neighbors punch hate a, you? I scream into a pillow. OK, OK. Yeah. Not bad. Not I scream bad. into a pillow or I punch a pillow. OK. All right. All uh, all really healthy ways to like um, to like move anger through the body. Um, but like emotions, they are, they're physical sensations when you really start to get into it. Like, how do we know we're feeling away? Because we're feeling something in our body. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Yeah. It's a lot of ouches today. It's a lot. I'm no, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Okay. So let, can you give us an example, whether it was a client or yourself of like how you sat and felt mm, Yeah. and got through it? And what did you feel? <sighs> yeah. Um, or what did they feel? I'll use myself. I'll okay. throw myself in the fire. There was a moment a, like a year ago where I I was actually having like what I would consider like an episode. Mm -hmm. What's an episode? And like like a like a trigger that like kind of like really threw like an emotion. So it, with CPTSD, instead of having like flashbacks, you have emotional flashbacks. And it's a it's a you feel exactly how you felt in a moment, but wow. you can't. So the nervous system doesn't know the difference between something happening in the moment and it just feeling like it. And that's the tricky part. And so I was like, OK, this is like it felt like my this is like so gruesome, but it's the only way that I can explain it. Sitting with the discomfort from trauma feels like your body's being drawn and quartered because it's going against everything you've ever been taught to mm -hmm. sit with it. And so I just told myself I was safe. I breathed through. I think I was in the fetal position on the floor. <laughs> wow. And I was like, okay, breathe. You are not there. You're okay. And it took me about like 10 minutes 
But I was, it was like, that was like one of the first times where I like pulled myself out of like a really serious moment of Mm -hmm. like, just like being totally not in the present moment. I focused on the way the rug felt on my legs. Mm -hmm. I was, I think I was in front of a heater. So I focused on the, the heat. So it's bringing yourself into the present moment is like the most powerful way because if you're in the present moment, then it, you know you're not back wherever that experience is. There's um, spread activation theory is what it's called. And it's it's when like the example that's used is like when somebody who has like a history of trauma looks at the color green, they're not just experiencing that color green in the moment. They're experiencing that color green in every other experience that they've experienced in their life. Oh, my goodness. So, wait, what does that mean? Let's say there's a smell. Okay. Okay. And that smell reminds you of something. You're not just smelling it in that current moment. Your nervous system is flashing through every other moment that it's smelled the smell. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And smells like one of the quickest sensory things that kind of brings us back, whether good or bad. Mm-hmm. And so to bring them out of that, you have to come into like the present moment. I oftentimes with clients will have them orient themselves to the room. So like putting their feet both flat on the floor, like look in front of you, look where the wall meets the ceiling, notice how the light feels on your skin, notice how what you're sitting on is pressing up against your body. Um, Because a lot of these, a lot of people being in their body feels very unsafe for them. Mm -hmm. And I have to reteach people that your body is actually the safest place for you to be. Mm -hmm. And so you have to start really slow. So that's even just with like, what do your clothes feel like sitting on your body? Just like focusing on those moments and really bringing people into the present moment. And then you can kind of like start working on healing that like wound, but you have to be able to be in the present moment first, or it's going to bring up all of this other stuff. Okay, so what are three things we can do right now to be in the present moment Mm, where we can feel Mm -hmm. safe in our body? Yeah, that's really great. Um, Breath, Mm -hmm. being connected to your breath. Um, So you can do something so simple as like focusing on the feeling of the breath leaving the bottom of your nostrils. Okay, I'm doing it right now. For just a moment. Okay. Right? Um. And then the other one is noticing how your clothes hang on your body. Like every place that your clothes sit and every place where they sit away from your skin. And noticing the difference between how it feels, where it's touching it, and how it feels where it's not. I'm seeing it right now. Okay. And then the other one, I really like bilateral stimulation. Okay, what is that So um, it's when you like do, so it comes from EMDR, which is a eye movement desensitization and rememorization. It's a treatment for PTSD. Mm -hmm. But you can integrate it in other ways. So butterfly hugs, like one of my favorite things to give to kids, but also adults. And you you um, cross your hands and you just gently tap okay. back and forth, and you can close your eyes if that feels safe. You can leave them on open. your chest. Like yep. It's okay. And like it's actually hitting some little nerves here that are attached to your vagus nerve. So that's also. But just focusing on the tap, mm-hmm. breathing in. And some people find it helpful to like count down from 100. But even just now, I'm already like calmer. It's one of my favorites. Was I making you nervous? No, not at all. Am I I upsetting you? No, not at all. It's just me being on camera. Okay. Okay, No, I like that. It's really nice. It is. It's really nice. Yeah, for sure. And you can teach it to kids too because it's like a little butterfly. Right. But it's just a rhythmic like back and forth. And it brings you... That tapping just repeatedly brings you back to in your body. Right. And again, I love how you said your body is the safest place for you. And it's learning to appreciate it for being safe. Yeah. Okay. So what are some signs that you have anxiety, that you're feeling it right Mm -hmm. now? Because I don't think we're taught this. So we could feel so many different things and we just think like, oh, I don't know. I just, you know, I'm I'm not present. I can't think. I don't know. Da, 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 da. So how do we know that we are experiencing anxiety? What signs should we look out for? Yeah, I think that I think there's general things that people can look out for. And I also think, like I said, for for some, it's going to be different. But for me, anxiety feels the best word I can give. And it's going to sound like a phone it in answer, but is ungrounded. It feels high. It feels chaotic. You can't focus. Mm -hmm. Um, It feels like it just it feels like it's like bouncing around inside of you kind of mm-hmm. is that's how I feel it oftentimes too like overthinking Ooh, 
I think what happens is that we are feeling anxious in our body and our mind is trying to figure out why. And so then it ruminates. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I mean, I'm the queen of overthinking. Mm -hmm. So like I joke all the time, like I get in my feeling in my head and hurt my own damn feelings. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. I'm there with you. I'll meet you there. All the time. Like I'm I'm there now. (laughs) Um, so, um, so overthinking can be one, um, you know, like fidget, like people who like Uh-oh. this can be a sign. Okay, uh, shaking not, your leg. It's not always, but this can. And this is the body trying to shake off the anxiety, <gasps> actually. So it's like our bodies really do inherently know we're just, we're not, we're every, every natural thing as humans that we kind of, they're kind of shut down. All of our like healthy coping things are kind of oftentimes shut down. Um, and why is that? Just because of like life, I think it's I think it's our world. I think it's I think it's yeah. I mean, I always I always come back to white supremacy, but right. like, right? <laughs> yeah. like, I do. I mean, I do because it's so foundational, especially in this country. Mm-hmm. I think we're taught to go against our natural instincts because our natural instincts would make us really powerful, mm-hmm. and we live in a system where they don't want us to be powerful. Right. I mean, individ- being an individual, individualistic goals is by far more celebrated than Way communal more. efforts, right? Right. Oh, this person did all this on their, like, they, like you're celebrated for it. Right. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you're so brave. You're so, and I'm not saying that you're not, but you can only get so far in healing by yourself. Right. At some point you need to have interactions with other people. Mm-hmm. I want to rewind a little bit. I thought it was interesting that you actually received your bachelor's in voice performance. I did. Wait, and then you switched over and focused on obviously holistic health. Yeah. And you were doing so great. Wait, what was the voice performance? So I've been singing since I was <gasps> little. Wait, you can sing? I sang opera professionally for a long Stop. time. Don't do this. <laughs> Wait, do you still, can you still? I, I mean, oh, I'm kind of? so rusty right now, That's but fine. like, yes, I, I mean, yes, I can still sing. Um, I, you know, it, I've been thinking about this lately. Cause like I've been, I've been on this journey. I'm like for the past like four or five years now. And like part of me thinks I picked music because it was my only thing that was truly mine. Mm-hmm. I didn't get to have much of an identity outside of a, another person in my, in my life. And so I love performing. Mm -hmm. I love being on stage. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I really come alive. I mean, a friend of mine was like, I can tell. I even even knew, like, just from your social media that you were a performer, like, before. Right. Like, because you clearly, like, like doing little bits. Right. (laughs) um, So I I did that. I sang opera professionally here for when I lived here. Mm -hmm. Did a little bit when I moved back to Portland. And then COVID hit. And then I was kind of like, the industry is just... Everything's it's so political oh, and like yeah, that too. I just was kind of like over it, and they're so critical of the voice and classical music. And I was just like, you know, I just would rather use like to like use my voice to like sing when I want to. And like um, a friend actually DM me the other day, and she's like, "Have you ever thought about doing like like voiceovers or meditations? Yeah. Like your voice is so calming." And I was like, "Yeah, I just have no idea how to get into that." Yeah, I totally <laughs> think it'd be amazing. Yeah, so that is. That is how, yeah, I did. I have my degree in something completely different. If I were doing it all over again, I don't know if I'd do music because it was a pretty useless degree, but it was. It's your passion. It's my passion. Hold on. (laughs) It's your passion. Okay. It is. I do. I love, I love, I do. I love performing. Okay. So what are the first steps to, I guess, sing in opera? I, so I started, I've been singing since I was little and then I, um, I started singing classical opera in like middle school and it's kind of one of those things that I was pushed into because it was like, oh, your voice kind of sounds like it could be a classical voice. And then I fell in love with it. Um, So like just start. Like that's what I say. Get a voice teacher and just start. Okay, let me practice and you tell me. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, that's a great bass. (laughs) You love me. I do. Because you are. <laughs> I know I sound horrible. But that's what I imagine. And that's what I I like, mean, that picture. is, it's very much like, <laughs> but like, it's like the voice comes from underneath. Can you give me like two notes? <sighs> Just so I don't sound bad on this pod. Um, let me even think of. Make me look better. Have yourself a merry little girl. 
Christmas. Wait. <laughs> I started too low, but. <laughs> wow. It was so soothing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, wait. So do all of your friends ask you to sing? No. Okay, well, I'll be the first. <laughs> Because I love it. Any of my friends that sing, shout out to my friend Salal, who has like just a beautiful voice. I'm always like, can you sing to me? Like, I have no shame in asking, but like, can you sing to me? I love me? that. I love that. Yeah, it's your yeah. gift. So yeah. I'm like, why don't you Most share your Most of my friends gift? ask me to twerk. Like, okay, honestly. That's, yeah, that like, too. It's, that's also it a happens. gift. <laughs> it's a gift. Everything's a gift. But I, I love that you can sing. That's so Thank cool you. to me. Thank you. I know I use my voice for important things now. That's really Ooh. all that matters to me. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what does it mean if you feel tightness, you know, around your vocal cords, your throat? Area? Usually it means you're not speaking your truth. <gasps> or there's something that you're not speaking. Uh oh. Yeah. It's like a, uh, yeah. yeah. Like from a metaphysical, like, yeah. Okay. So interesting enough, I had a friend of mine, phenomenal singer, Melanie Fiona mm -hmm. on the show, right? And she was talking about a really hard time in her life where she couldn't sing. Mind you, she's a Grammy winner. Yeah. She can sing ballads. She's like remarkable. And she had to go get Reiki work done. And it helped, it helped clear open up the yeah. her throat. What? Because like Reiki is like a like chakra balancing. And okay. so like a lot of times from like a Eastern. So I, I grew up in, in a cult based in an Eastern religion. So I'm like very familiar with like Ayurveda. Um, and like, that is like a lot of times, like the inability from that standpoint to like speak or say something or like feeling tightness in your throat is that like your throat chakra is like closed off. And so there's lots of different things you could do, but like, that's why like, so like the vagus nerve is like, I talk about indigenous people have known about the power of the vagus nerve since. So let me back up. One of the things that bothers me about the work that I'm in is that I love evidence-based because evidence-based gives us right. proof that things work. And also there's some things that work that like, I don't care why they work, mm -hmm. but they just work. And so much of the stuff when it comes from to nervous system regulation is coming from indigenous practices and indigenous cultures have known about these things for millennia. So like Buddhist monks who chant Om for a period of time before they go into long, deep meditation, do that because they know it stim stimulated the vagus nerve and took them into a state of relaxation so they could actually meditate. Is that why? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, wait, how do I do it? Oh, oh, it's like really deep. Like deep. you can hum. Yeah, and you can also like just like any deep hum. Mm -hmm. Like if you're feeling um, like little kids will actually, if you ever notice like little kids, like when they're trying to fall asleep, like, Mm. Oh, sometimes, oh, they'll do that. Mm. They're calming themselves. Like, they don't know that's what they're doing, but that's, it's like baby cap, remember? Yeah. Yes, yes. That's, this is a nervous system regulation tool. If oh. you're feeling anxious, you hold a th your thumb. Yeah. And you take a deep breath and you hold it until you kind of start to feel a pulse in your finger. And then you do it on so each finger. <gasps> and it helps. Again, it brings that pressure, brings you into the present like, moment. I do that all the time. Yeah. And I, I find notice. myself doing this all I the time. I hold my thumb in yeah. with like my fingers, but I'm not realizing why. Right. But I don't feel the pulse. But I think, I mean, it's like. Like meaning in the moment of when I'm doing it. It's very subtle. Well. If I'm thinking of it, I can feel it. Like yes. right now, because yeah. like I'm clearly connecting the and two. I would say that if you're noticing you're naturally doing that, that's an indicator that you're probably a little bit anxious or dysregulated. Just in general, if you're walking mm -hmm. around like this in mm -hmm. general. Okay, so yes. Because your body's just inherently trying to find it. Yeah, I'm anxious. Yeah. I'm right, okay? It's okay. Okay, we know this. You know, okay. we love we love anxious girlies. Yes. We are anxious girls. <laughs> like the people that's think, who we are. People think all the time, they're like, well, you're just like never... Because I get, I, I also have a very calming presence, but like, yes. people are like, you're just like never anxious. And I'm like, yeah, you don't know. You, uh, I'll, I'll text Lauren and be like, Lauren, I'm your spinning friend. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and luckily. Or I'll text Gio and be like, I'm in my head. <laughs> and for people who are listening, Gio is your partner. Yeah, you guys yeah. have been together for a long time. So, okay. I have a question back to that because you brought Gio up. So when you're screaming in the pillow or punching a <laughs> pillow, the first time you did this and your significant other noticed this, what did he do? Oh, he's not, I, we don't live together. So I was, I was but in my apartment. But he's never seen you do this. No, never. <laughs> okay, so wait, has, have you done anything to just relax yourself that he noticed and was like, what is happening right now? What is she doing? 
I don't know. That's actually a really good question. I'm so curious. I'm generally like pretty calm, like regulated yeah. around him. Okay. Does that yeah. bother him? That I'm regulated yeah. around him? Yeah. Like, because, you know, some people are like, you're so calm right now. It's like you're a killer. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Is he chaotic? <laughs> That's probably why you guys get along. That's all I needed to hear. I mean, he's a football ref. We'll just put it at that. Like you have to be a little chaotic to be yeah. a ref. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. So you're the calm. I mean, no. You're the calm. I mean, I think we balance each other. I think it's a really nice way, but he also guzzles coffee. So I feel like I he do too, is. Though. Do you? Oh yeah. I love it. When we go traveling, we literally just go coffee shop to coffee shop. Now, okay. I've heard mixed things about coffee. Like, okay, it could be good this for is a you really good it, question, actually. Yeah. So is it good for us or no? So some people just do not metabolize caffeine well. Mm -hmm. And if you don't metabolize caffeine, it, it's going it's going to make you like some people be like, oh, I cut out coffee. So I did matcha. And it's like, OK, well, then caffeine might have kind of been the issue. But like you can still metabolize coffee if you're able to or caffeine if you're able to do matcha. Caffeine doesn't really bother me, which is really so it really is just person to person. Right. Um, some people cut out caffeine and if that like gets rid of your anxiety that then it was just the caffeine but most often than not it's not just the caffeine caffeine um so it really is it's really person to person um I, I I've cut out it before and didn't really notice much a difference and I love coffee so I'm like I'm just gonna like keep it in my life but sometimes the kind like so I remember like six or seven months ago I like just grabbed some off the shelf from Trader Joe's and it actually made me have like heart palpitations. <gasps> uh oh. And then I was like, okay, well, and I didn't realize what it was until I was like, I think it's this coffee. And then I went and got from like a local roaster in Portland and completely went away. So like sometimes the coffee itself, like the roast it, or whatever might also be impacting you. But like coffee is a mix, it's a mixed bag. So I always tell people to experiment with that one. Right. Um, I also put like a ton of herb, like different functional herbs in my coffee in the morning. So I don't know if that also impacts like its effects. So I'll do like reishi mushroom, which is like one that's really great for the nervous system or, um, like pearl powder is also really great for the nervous okay, system. Okay, wait, let's talk about this. What <laughs> are functional herbs? What does that even mean? Functional herbs are herbs that have a function. Okay. So not just like, I mean, all technically all herbs do, but like culinary herbs, like usually people don't look at them as like a medicinal or functional herb. Oh. So you can use them that way, but like functional herbs to me are like ones that like we use to, ha to have a specific function. And do you believe it works? I mean, yeah, I'm an herbalist, but I'm also like a middle of, the, I always tell people I'm like, I'm woo woo and also like evidence-based, like I said. So there are a lot of really amazing herbs out there that can help. And what I say, the way I use herbs is they're allies. They mm. themselves are not going to cure your anxiety. They're not going to cure your trauma but they can be a really great ally and help support in the healing. And so when it comes to nervous system and anxiety, you want to look for herbs that are in the nervine ca category, which is like nerves that support the nervous system. And so there's ones that help like stop spinning thoughts. There's ones that help with like the body anxiety and the physical like aspects of it. There's ones that help stimulate the nervous system. There's ones that help calm the nervous system. So I am a huge proponent um, for integrating, I mean, I drink, I eat herbs and drink herbs all day, all, all day long. Okay. <laughs> Give us some of your favorites and what they, you know, help with obviously yeah. not curing, but no, but they'll help. They, they will help. Um, I love their allies too. Yes. They're allies. I love lemon balm. Kids can take it. It's great for kids. It's in the mint family has a really nice, subtle, like lemony mint kind of flavor. And it kind of gives an over, not only does it help to relax the nervous system, but it also over time helps to like nourish the nervous mm -hmm. system. Um, so that one I love. I love passion flower. It stops the ruminating and spinning thoughts like it like shuts them off. It's really, really amazing. What are some of my How other How do you favorites? make it? You can do, for lemon balm, it's great in tea. Okay. You can make tea. tinctures out of them. Okay. Um, some people will do like capsules, different herbs have different constituents that are pulled out in different ways. So like alcohol is going to pull out some different ones than just like making tea, but overall you're going to get the medicinal impact of them either way. Um, like roots are better to like be boiled. You can't really just like pour water over them cause mm -hmm. it won't pull out the constituents. So you have to do like a, what's called a decoction. What's an example of a root? Kava, kava root is one. 
What does kava do? Valerian root. Kava is an interesting one because it actually has really deep cultural roots in um, in the South Pacific. Mm-hmm. It really calms you down um, and gets you almost a little bit high. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. It tastes like absolute butthole. <laughs> I was not expecting that. I was not expecting that to come after. You're going to feel a little high. You're going to feel you're going to feel amazing, but it tastes like it is terrible. Ugh. Roots have a tendency to be pungent because yeah. they're like in the earth and it's kind of oftentimes where like right. the most potency of the plant is. But yeah, that one's great. I always just say like do some research, make sure you're being culturally aware and not like Um, you know, taking anything away from the indigenous people where it comes from. Valerian roots, another one that smells like dirty feet, but really it's a great muscle relaxer and body relaxer. Really? Yeah. So wait, you're supposed to boil and then drink it or eat it? You boil and drink it. Okay. Yeah. Um, Kava ones is also one you have to be careful with, with like oversaturation of the liver. So some herbs you just want to be like cognizant of of the impacts that they have also like long-term. It doesn't mean don't take it. It just is like, just be conscious of how often and, and when you do it. Um, God, I whatever reishi mushroom is a really, really great overall nervous system. There's um, in traditional Chinese medicine they call it reishi babies. So women who take reishi while they're pregnant, they have these babies who are just really regulated and calm and kind of zen, and and um, so that's kind of cool. Um, I, yeah, I could talk about herbs for. And what do you use every morning? In my lately, I'll switch it up. But lately, I've been doing. Heshu Wu, which is a traditional Chinese herb that helps with like hair, skin, and nails. Um, and it also has like a calming effect on the nervous system. Pearl powder, which is literally ground up pearls. Really? Um, mm-hmm. In traditional Chinese medicine, it's known as a Shen tonic, which Shen means like, cal- like just like calm. Um, it's also really high in like bioavailable biotin. So like it's great for your skin. It's used as a beauty tonic as well in, tra- wow. in, in Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. What else? Rose. I've been using rose which helps with like balancing the female hormones um, and like cramping during your wow. menstrual cycle. I think that's all. I think that's where, what so where do you go to get this? Herbal stores. Herbal stores. Yeah. Okay. So those exist. Those do exist. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some really great, like a, a good friend of mine, she owns a company called Root and Bones and mm-hmm. she, she just has a line of traditional Chinese tonic herbs that she sells. So would you think it's best if someone who's interested in this to you know, consult with an herbalist I first? do. I, okay. Like, or a doctor. Because I do think... So doctors don't know anything about herbs. Interesting. Okay. Usually. I, I not take, all. Not all. We're never generalized. We're never generalized, but that's not something that they're taught. A good herbalist should know contraindications with medications, or at least be able to look that up. Should know, like, if it's safe during pregnancy and breastfeeding, or if you're trying to get pregnant. Like, should know these things. There's no regulation around herbalists in right. the United States. Um, so there's really good ones. And then there's obviously just like every field, not not as great ones. Right. And so I always say, do your, I, I do think that there's, back to like nervous system, I think that there's, the nervous system thrives on autonomy and ha- having the empowerment to like learn and educate yourself, I think is really powerful. So I think it's important to do your own research. And also if you're unsure, like check with a practitioner. So Absolutely, yeah. things like peppermint, like something you'd think, Oh, this is great for everybody. It is. We love it. But if you're breastfeeding and you drink a lot of peppermint tea, it can it can actually dry your milk up. So like, there's certain things that you wouldn't even think that you would want to check with. Like, of of course, a cup of peppermint tea is not gonna right. be harmful. But if you're drinking like peppermint tea every day and you're breastfeeding, like you might yes. want to be aware of that. Right. You might not want to dry your milk up. Wow. So there's things like that. So where does someone start when it comes to research? Where do they With go? Herbs. Get a book. Um. There's so many great books out there. I'm trying to think of like I have any so recommendations many. that you have. Or I if could you post send about- you some. Yeah, I'll send you some. There's, um, I think her name is Karen Rose. She is a or Empress up. Karen Rose. I think might she wrote one that like covers the historical, cultural. Okay, so this is okay. Tell me if this is it. I looked it up really quick by Karen M Rose. The Art and Practice of Spiritual Herbalism. Can I Transform- see the cover of it? Yep. Yes, that's it. That's okay. one of my favorite books. Okay, so this book, The Art and Practice of Spiritual Herbalism, Transform, Heal, and Remember with the Power of Plants and Ancestral Medicine by Karen M. Rose. Love her. As an herbalist, we have like the physical things that things do, but also like 
there's always like an emotional or metaphysical kind of like component as well. And so I really love that she touches into that as well. So um, even if you're not into that, she also still has just like the physical things that it covers, which is amazing. Okay, great. Okay, so at least we know somewhere to start. Yeah. Yeah. And also like you can check your local library. Like there are some really People great. People still go to the library. I use the Libby app. Have you heard of this? No, but I love this. I used to go to the library all the time okay. but for different reasons. So the Libby <laughs> app, I have like an old iPad that I watch things like read things on okay. now, but you can even do it on your phone. You can check books out. Like, but Stop. they're on, but they're like, they're like, they just download on your phone no. and then they get returned when you're done. No, no, no. Yeah. And this I, is the great. best I, for, I, it's the best. Bring I love the it. libraries back. Yeah, it's called the Libby app. And so you, you link it up to your local library card. If you don't have <gasps> one, it, it walks you through doing it and taking you to the website. And then I've, I've read so many, like I've read so many I books on it. I love this idea. Yeah. Yeah, I love it, and it's gotten me to read more because I used I I was a library kid growing up. That is so great. I'm glad you used it for good. I remember trying to meet boys there when I was younger. <laughs> it's a long time ago, but it was a great way. You know what? To though, get out of the you house, were, you were trying to go for smart boys. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it. Sorry, mom and dad, if you're listening, but I mean that's so great though. Yeah, it's an amazing. I a friend told me about it because I wanted to start reading because I I always have an anti racism book going. And then like a healing kind of like right. nervous system book going. And I was like lying in bed one night reading like, I think I was actually reading Abolition for the People. And I was like, you know, I probably By the way, Kaepernick Publishing, thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> <Shameless plug. laughs> okay. But I was like, you know, this, maybe this isn't like my before bed wind down yeah, kind get, of yeah. content. <laughs> it's not I love call it. Me it's important. I need yeah. it. But like maybe not. And so I was like, maybe I'll it's go back. Breakfast. To, it's Lunch. for breakfast. That's yeah. when I do. I like when I drink my coffee, yeah. I'll read it in the morning. But I was like, maybe I need some like fiction at night before bed. And so then my friend's like, yeah. And I'm, but then I'm like buying a fiction book every couple of weeks. Right. And that's like just not sustainable. I don't need all these books. Right. And she was like, yeah, check out the Libby app. It's changed my life. It's amazing. I'm so happy to hear this. Yeah. Do you think it supports libraries? It I think it does. Okay. I'm going to download it. Yeah. I'm here for this. Yeah. Because I feel like we should protect libraries in general. Thousand percent. Thousand wow. percent. Okay. Not only have you helped us. <laughs> Listen, I'm good for a lot of things. Yeah, self-regulate. <laughs> you taught me opera notes. And now we're saving libraries. We are saving libraries. Okay. So I want to switch gears a little bit and tell me what you know about this. And it's okay if you don't know anything and okay. I'm just throwing stuff on you. What do you know about chakras and that kind of world of like, you know, connecting with our inner self? So first I'm going to tell you it's chakra. Okay. Oh. Because... Any person's going to be like, she does not know how to say I it, I don't. Right? I apologize. And I'm not saying, I yeah. wasn't saying that, but like, I have a friend who is a indigenous yoga teacher who's writing a book on decolonizing yoga right now. And that's like the number one thing is she'll Ooh. like criticize people and being like, they don't even say chakra, right? Like, no. Okay. So it's a CH, but everybody says SH, but I'm just, so you know. Okay. Say <laughs> it one more time for me. Chakra or just chakra? Chakra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chakra. Um, so it's the energy, according to like ancient yoga, I'll tell you what I think I know. It, it could be wrong. So right. um, it, it's the energy system in the system and it's like different gateways. So you have your root chakra and then second, I believe, is your reproductive. Third is your like navel point. Mm -hmm. Fourth is your solar plex. Fifth is your heart. Sixth is your third eye. And then the seventh is like your your auric, like one at the top. And each one has a different color that's associated with it. It's like I know heart is green. Root is red, I believe. Oh, the it's crown like, is purple. Red crown is purple. Right. Throat is oh, blue. Let me look up. Hold on. Let me see. Throat chakra color. Oh, chakra. See, no, you're gonna get it. Oh, it's it's on. okay. <laughs> Said it wrong. Okay, hold on. I have the colors. Okay, it's we red, a, orange, yellow, right? Yeah. So the crown is kind of. I don't know what color. I think it's violet. Is. is it violet? Yeah, violet. More violet, and then. The, gosh, why did I pick like the most, <laughs> the hardest poster to look at? Okay, so the third eye, which, which, which it's right here. Right here. Okay, that's more purple. Okay. The throat is blue. That's what I thought. Heart is green. The solar plexus is yellow. What is that? The, like, that's our where stomach? your voice, like, that's where, like, your, they say your power exists in your solar plexus. Oh, it's right. Okay. Your solar plexus, it's like, you know, where your ribs kind of like come up? It's like right. right in that spot. Okay, got it. And then, the sacral, 
cycle. Yeah, that's yep. Yeah, that's like your lobe. That's your reproductive. Okay. Yeah. And then the root seems like that's like your 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 butthole. Yeah, your was like <laughs> that's the region it's in, but that's red. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we didn't. I don't think we said the sacral color, which is orange, according okay. to this chart. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Was this something that you were ever interested in learning it about? I grew, so I grew up with it. Okay. So yeah, only share what you're comfortable yeah. with. Like as far as like, you know, uh, your upraising and how you know so much information. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in a cult. A cult. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from about age eight till about 32, like like about like four years ago, five wow. years ago. Um, That's a long time. It was a long time. And it was based in a, a bastardized form of Sikhism, which mm-hmm. is why I have my name. Um the way it is um and so uh and it was like it's kundal if you've ever heard of kundalini yoga or three ho is the name so very much based on like so in yoga it's in the in the way that i was taught which i realized like sometimes it's not accurate but a lot of like the whole idea of like kundalini is like that energy going up your spine through all of the chakras out through the top of your head and mm-hmm. that's like the idea of like if you want to call it like enlightenment or um, like awareness. Um, so there's a belief that like certain chakras can be like blocked. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really like, I honestly like don't know. I'm not like in depth about it, but that's kind of like what I was taught of like, oh, like you need to open your heart chakra or like, right, right. or like I, the BS that I grew up with, it was like, Oh, like you've got you're you're stuck in your root chakra and that's like bad or like right. stuff like that. <laughs> I would have fell for all of it. I would have been like, I did. Yes, and I did everything. So you were like basically born into it. This wasn't a choice that it you had. It wasn't it no. It was not it yeah, was I, I wasn't born, but I it was it was early you were a child. on. I was a child. Yeah, like yeah. you didn't yeah. really have a choice in how no. you were gonna be no. you know, brought up. So yeah. that is really interesting. Yeah. And then up to a few years ago. Yeah. You decided to change? There was like a, actually like 2020, there was a big, um, a book was written um, by one of the leaders and he's long gone. He's been gone since 2004. Um, And since then, just uh, a flood of um, trigger warning, but like sexual assaults and abuse accusations came out. And there was a lot of kids who went to school in India. I did not. um, And so it's been just like, and then I, and then at the, around that same time, I, I really dove deep into my own anti-racism journey. And so I learned how I had unknowingly participated with a lot of cultural appropriation and harmful behaviors then. So that, that's really where I started learning how to like just get uncomfortable and know that like, I think that when it comes to the nervous system mm-hmm. and healing, there's a point where we all have to take accountability for a role that we play in our suffering. And that is not a victim shaming thing. Mm -hmm. And especially the things that happened in your childhood, you were not responsible for. But once we're adults, you aren't responsible or at fault for the trauma that happened to you, but you are responsible for healing it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, trauma is oftentimes an explanation for our behaviors but it's not an excuse for our behaviors and that's the uh, the accountability part is where oftentimes people stop their anti-racism journey they stop their healing journey because they can come to peace or come to a place of like okay these things happened to me and it wasn't okay it's my fault but the moment where you're like oh but that one time i did that one thing and that was really up Mm -hmm. and maybe i should sit with like what is that? What do I think that means about me? What if that doesn't, what's that? What if that's just a part of me? What if that doesn't actually like identify me or, or say anything about who I am, but I know why I did it, but I still need to take accountability for what I did it. That's where people stop. Mm. And I get it because it's excruciating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I want to ask you, so how did you learn to not resent, you know, people who Mm. basically had you in a cult environment. That wasn't your decision to be raised in it. So how did you learn? uh, Or did you not even have resentment? Or like, how did this work when you realized like, okay, I'm going to... Well, that's like the least part of my trauma too, which is so interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's interesting. But that being said, um, I think I still work on that one. Mm -hmm. I... There is... Another kind of like thing that's happened to like pop, I'm going to call it pop healing, like mm-hmm. pop psychology is 
this what I, does that mean like like popular like popular healing got it got it white, they, kind of like whitewashed it. healing let's say we hear about it all the time we hear it all, all the time our timeline it's everywhere right. people make like statements and people are like oh my god this is pro- so profound and i'm like is it though like, <laughs> like right. is that profound right um healing is there is there's no such thing as healed Ever, huh? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. This is just my opinion. Right. I don't think there's such thing as healed because I think once we're healed, we're done with this human experience and we are moving on to whatever the next thing is. Because healed to me means you're never triggered again. Mm-hmm. You don't have reactions and to things. And that's not going to be the case. And that's not going to be right. the case. We're all going to have, we're all, like, it is a non-linear experience. And I think that it's the same thing with like, there's no end goal to anti-racism and decolonization. It's just like constantly learning and constantly applying, right? right? Same thing with healing. Like, oh, looking back and being like, okay, a similar thing happened now that happened five years ago that what it sent me for a t- tailspin for a month. And I just got over that in two hours. Okay, I'm healing. That's a win. That's a f-ing win. Absolutely. Like, oh that, my gosh. that is a win. Yes. And please acknowledge that. We need, and I tell my clients this all the Ooh. time celebrate every win. I don't care if it's literally that you only pooped once today. Right. It's okay. Like, that's a win. That's fine. That's great. Yes. Three weeks ago, you weren't pooping every three days. So, right. like, let's celebrate yes. that. This is a win. This is a win. So, I think that. Healing's not linear. It really does sometimes feel like you take three steps forward and t- or two steps forward and three steps back. And a huge component to, to nervous system work is self-compassion mm. and self-compassion with accountability. Right. You got to have both. You can't have healing without accountability. Wow. You just can't. It doesn't exist. Wow. Because we have all caused, caused harm somewhere. Right. We all have, Mm -hmm. whether we meant to or not. And self-compassion, I always, when I'm being really unkind to myself, I like look at a photo of little me and I'm like, oh, but I'm being mean to her. Mm. And she's already hurting so much. Mm. Let me give her some love. And So how do you give your younger self love? Hand on the chest and I close my eyes and I usually like visualize her. (gasps) <gasps> and I see if she has something to say to me and I give her space. Really? Yeah. That's deep. Yeah. I don't think I've done that. It's really powerful. Inner child work is, so I relate to, I have a friend who's a therapist and I'm going to toot my own horn here for just a second. I shared this with her and she's like, that's actually genius. And she started using it with all of her clients. Okay. You need so, to go ahead and get your degrees <laughs> and become a therapist. I think about it all the time. I but think then I'm like, phenomenal. thank you. Absolutely. Thank I you. do. So your nervous system is your inner child and your mind is like the adult. Your nervous system reacts first. Our nervous, we are body up creatures. So our bodies feel it. And then we move this way. So let's say your nervous system feels something and your mind can either go, we're actually really safe. Like, look, there's not a tiger in the room. Like, we're good. Let's go for a walk. Let's grab an ice pack. Or your mind could be like, but I think there is a tiger in the room. (laughs) And then this is dysregulated and this is dysregulated and it's a perfect storm. And so that's kind of how I look at it. I look at the mind as the parent and the nervous system as, as the child. And it really helps. So really, I mean, we hear about this all the time. Is it true that we are functioning in our adult selves through the lens of our childhood traumas? Yeah, because your your nervous system, I think that your nervous system freezes in the moments of our childhood that feel good and feel bad, right? Mm-hmm. And so it is like your perception of the world is probably completely different than mine for a multitude of reasons, right. for lots of different reasons. Mm-hmm. And like, even if we had identical nervous system upbringings, it still would be different. Right. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So we know what a trigger is, right? It's like a trigger to an unsafe moment or something that didn't feel good. Well, we also have glimmers, which are really amazing. And those are moments where we felt safe and connected. Mm. And so another great tool is when you're feeling, if you're feeling triggered, if you're feeling unsafe, connecting with a moment in which you felt safe. And some people feel like they'll say, I don't ever have one. And I say, make one up. Maybe you visualize a pet or an animal that would feel safe to you. Or even a moment where you felt mo- joy for just a moment. Right. And you can literally kind of like hold on to that and feel it radiate throughout your body and use that as an anchor point to bring you back to the present moment. 
Oh, that's good. Yeah. What is a memory for you that brings you so much joy? Mm. That you tap into to that feel that? That I tap that? into? Usually being at the ocean. There's something about being in front. Being in nature is just very inherently regulating, yeah. for one. But I think that the beauty about the ocean is it reminds us how small we are. Oh, yeah. And I think that it's equally as important for us to understand how big we are and remember how small we are. And not small as in make yourself smaller, but like in the scheme of the world, we're so little. Right. Oh, that's a good one. And I think that's important to remember. Yeah. I like that one. The ocean is a good one for just so many reasons. For so many reasons. You can like, I can literally like close my eyes and feel like breathe, smells, yeah. like everything. Oh yeah. Everything. My feet in the sand. Okay. So how important is diet and lifestyle mm. changes when it comes to managing anxiety? Um, well, I'm not a dietitian, so I will preface with that. Right. Um, we're and not I know, doctors. I know you know that. We're not doctors. Again. <laughs> Um, I think, okay, so I always try to come from a place of accessibility mm -hmm. and understanding that not everybody has access to the same things. And so while I think it can have an impact on it, in general, eating is a regulation tool. If your blood sugar is diving, you're probably going to be anxious. I mean, like, people could have like a lot of different things to say about this, but I think the most important thing is just to make sure you're eating. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you have the ability to like make sure you're getting vegetables and proteins and carbs and like all the things, yes. But I also very much come from a place that not everybody has access to that. And I always want to recognize that because right. I don't want anybody to ever think that healing is inaccessible to them because they don't have the resources. Right. Mm. That's really important for me. Right. Yeah. What What happens in that case? Right. Somebody doesn't have access to a therapist. Mm -hmm. They don't be it money or maybe their parent doesn't want them yeah. to go or whatever. You know, what can they do, if anything at all? I, I mean, tell people that if they go to my Instagram page and they follow everything I post about, they'd be pretty good. <laughs> I'm not and I'm not trying this. to promote myself no, in no, any no. way. You have really good but tips. But I'm like, a, I do. I yeah. try. A friend of mine recently came up to me and he was like, I, I really need to thank you for what you provide because I just recently had a shift in my relationship to anxiety. And the first thing I did was went to your page and binge watched. Right. And he was like, how much money do you make off social media? And I'm like, zero. He's right. like, you do all that for free. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. because accessibility is big for me. Um, it's probably, you know, why I don't make a lot of money. Right. <laughs> but it's why you, the it's struggle why, continues. It's, struggle it's continues. okay. But I, um, I do think, um, okay, if you could do, if you don't have access to any of those things, integrating in um, a cold shower, as terrible as it sounds, really can make a, a difference. If you can get out for a, 15, a minimum of a 15-minute walk every day, that will change your life mm -hmm. because it's bilateral stimulation. You're like mm -hmm. back and forth. I will like I'll have days where I'm like super in my head or like anxious and I'll be like, all right, time for a nervous system walk. And I'll get walking for 10 minutes. And I'll be like, what was I even worrying about 20 minutes ago? Like it just like quickly pulls you into your body. Mm. I keep my phone away. I'll like notice the smell in the air. Notice the, the vibration of my steps through my body. Uh, is the sun out? Is it raining? Is it cold? Like really bringing myself into that present moment. And like you can do things like butterfly tapping. You can do that every single day and it will help to. Um, I don't like to use the word strength in the nervous system, but it will help to create flexibility in the nervous system. Do you make your significant other Geo do these practices with you? I mean, no. And he won't do it anyways. I'm sure he would. He doesn't want to be healed. I know. <laughs> Geo doesn't want to be healed. That's not true. <laughs> Geo doesn't want to be healed. No, he does his own stuff. Does yeah, he really? Yeah. I don't know what it is, but I know he does. <laughs> so good he's, though. A, he's good he's good okay <laughs> okay so you never like hey let's do a breathing exercise or does he ever wonder or ask you because you do have such great thank you i mean he does tips. watch my instagram stuff like i know that okay. like i'm always so curious i gotta I'm, ask you next yeah, time ask him actually ask him because i'm not there's sure there's no way i mean look i don't know all your friends but i doubt everybody is as um well evolved as you and you know on their healing journey as close to you yeah. so I'm always curious how people feel like do they feel like oh I can't really say this because I don't want her to be disappointed or I get more help <sighs> us save us I do I get okay so I am the friend that people call when they're having a panic attack mm -hmm. um, or text um, I am 
I, I, I try to come from a really, I mean, obviously like there's no such thing as a non -ju no, no judgment person, but I really always try to come from a place of like no judgment for people. Yeah. I'm like, this is a safe space. Like you are feeling what you're feeling. Like I, even with my clients, I'm like, I have this thing called rage writing that I oftentimes recommend for my clients. It's when they're feeling really angry and they're feeling those like ugly things come up in themselves and they don't want them to. And so they're trying to shut them down. I'm like, write it down on paper. Like write the, even if it's like that person's such a, like whatever it is, write right. it down, get it out. Of, you're already feeling it. It doesn't make you a bad person. What makes you a bad person is if you repress it and then it comes out in other ways and hurts people. Ooh. So yeah. just let like that shadow, like, like identify the unseen parts of yourself and like, just let it be seen, burn it, tear it up, whatever. Um, so I really try to just like hold space for however people, obviously people say like problematic things, I'll, I'll like call them on it, but I'm usually the friend that people like come to for that. Um, I do get a lot of like DMS that are like your, this saved my life or like I was having constant panic attacks and now I don't have them at all. Cause I think one of the things with anxiety too, is that people often get anxious about being anxious yes because they know like last time they had a panic attack or last time this happened and so knowing they even just have a tool at their fingertips is empowering enough to where it keeps it at bay right right absolutely yeah you mentioned shadow what does shadow mean yeah so shadow work is the there's a few different definitions but it's the it's the un it's kind of like the unseen so the parts of ourselves that i i also often relate anti-racism work to shadow work because especially like being a white person who grew up in America, there are biased parts of me that I don't like that I might not know are there. And so it's identifying those mm -hmm. and bringing that to light so they are no longer harmful. So when I first started, I was an anxiety coach was kind of how I labeled myself. And then I like shifted because I was like, I don't want to just talk about anxiety. Um, and I was like one of like a few that I knew of, like kind of like on the scene. Now, every time I open my app, there's a new like nerve. Then I'm not, there's not necessarily anything right. wrong with it. But what I would say is if you are fault, like re there's things to look out for. Yes. What do we look out there's for? There's things to look out for. How do we know we are getting the right guidance or right yeah. insight? That's why I asked you about research. Like, yeah. When it comes to herbs, like how do we yeah. even start? How do we know if you know, a coach is reputable. Yeah, I think, so I look at, um, are they recognizing practices that they, um, like where practices are originating and coming from? I think that's a really big one for me. Um, are they, um, are they using your, if they're just talking about having a calm nervous system, they don't really, it's not about a calm nervous system. You don't want just a calm nervous system. You want a flexible nervous system that knows how to find safety. Um, so like, that's another kind of like, I would call like an orange flag. Uh -huh. Um, if they are talking about manifestation, um, and telling you, you can't manifest because you have a dysregulated nervous system. That's not a red flag. That's a bomb. So go run so wow. far because manifestation is already such a privileged, right? Mm. Like you can't manifest your way out of systemic oppression and racism, mm. right? Like we can't, that's not a thing. There's work. There there's needs to be like work. there's needs to be work. And like, right. do I think manifestation is real? It probably is, but like in the way that it's been marketed is like, oh, it's because you're you're dysregulated and that's why you can't call in what you like. And it's like, then how far down the path are we we're gonna go? We're we gonna say that you called in abuse, or we're we gonna say that you called in like all of mm -hmm. these other things. So anything like that, not I would I I would just look for people who resonate who don't shame if they're using mm. shaming languages like should it, I always tell people don't should all over yourself like <laughs> okay. should is such a shame based oh, like word you should do yeah. something yeah yeah okay like when you hear yourself being like oh I should be doing this I always am like okay what why am I like should I like is that something I need to be doing or do I think that I need to be doing that and so like should is very shame a shamed based word Ooh. um yeah, those are probably the main things that I would say. And also, I think representation. So look for look for people who look like you because there's mm -hmm. there's lots of us out there. Where does someone go to study the somatic nervous system? Like, what, I mean, when I was coming yeah. up, like, you know, my parents didn't understand anything unless it was like doctor, engineer, lawyer, something, right? That they could understand, oh, this profession is tangible. That means you're going to have somewhat stability in this world, yeah. right? 
So where does someone go to learn about this? Because I don't I obviously don't think society promotes, you know, the inner work, the healing. It doesn't. Because <clears throat> right? it can't because it can't capitalize off of that. Right. Well, it actually backwards capitalizes off of that. Right. And they're mad about that. And they're mad about that. And it's like the only work connected that I can think of is a therapist or yeah. A psychologist. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, there are. So, the, again, the coaching industry is not regulated. So there are like a lot. The thing is, is though, like there's a lot of terrible therapists out there, too. I've had clients come to me who've had horrific experiences right. You're with not therapists. Gonna, it, nothing's Every perfect. Every field Even is going to have, have degree you just got to find, you got to find the people that right. work for you. I would start, so like I said, Resmo Menicum's, um, My Grandmother's Hands is probably a book that changed my life. I, I, I use it with clients all the time. I refer back to it. Can you say it one more time? Um, my Grandmother's Hands. Okay, it's Resma, R-E-S-M. AA, I believe, mm -hmm. Menachem, M E N A K E M, I believe. Great for trauma, nervous system. That's actually a trauma and anti racism book. Right. Profound. Um, and he breaks it down like if you're a white body, you read the book like this. If you are live in a dark body, you read the book like this. If you live in a blue body, because it also talks about cops um, oh. and, and their generational, tr like, and how, how we got to where we are now. This it's is really so interesting because I didn't understand that when you were talking about it. I was like, what does this mean? Like yeah. body, body, It's body. about generational, which is like a whole, I mean, we could do a whole episode right. on like generational trauma and like, you know, your, your nervous system, you're wow. born with the nervous system basically of like your parent, like your parents. So if, is that real? Yeah. Yeah. They've actually, so when your mom was pregnant, when your grandmother was pregnant with your mom at five months, the egg that became you was in your mom. So uh, epigenetics goes back three generations. So if your mom experienced something traumatic and didn't resolve it, you may experience things that you didn't even live through your nervous system that she Stop experienced. It. Do, it's they've pr they like proven it at this point. How I don't know, but it's if you look up epigenetics, it's Hold like on, pretty phenomenal. It's like <laughs> we need it. We need you to come back and I'll we need back. to sit down with a. How do you say this? Epigenetics yeah. expert. We need. We someone. need to get Resma so, on the podcast. Yeah, that's who we need. <laughs> like, if, okay, please, because clearly we need this. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, that's what generational trauma is, right? And so it's like, oh. I mean, you hear about it from yeah, we everybody, hear it. Yeah, right? We see it on the timeline right? all like, the time. You can be, um, like, for example, I had an aunt who was like terrified of cats. Never had a bad experience of cats in her life. Her mom, while pregnant with her, was walking down the stairs into a basement and a cat like jumped on her back and like n and she was born with cat phobia. Do you believe it started this? from like a young, young age? I do. Wait, because I think on. there's stuff wait, beyond your, wait, what we know. Did your aunt know this before? No, she didn't find out about <gasps> she didn't find out about it until like like until she was like old enough to understand. Stop. But oh. she was terrified of cats from like the moment that she could identify a cat. Wow, we have some work to do. I know, it's wild. Okay, we definitely need an expert and you need to be here <laughs> when that expert's here. We'll, we'll do some research. <laughs> okay, wow. Okay, so what are some beginner-friendly ways for people to integrate herbalism in their life? Mm, Just simple tea. things. Tea. tea. Yeah. Tea. Go to a herbal store. I always say, like, kind of see what calls to you. Like, li like if you're, like, you can Google, like, herbs for, like, whatever, if you're looking for something specific, but, like, Making tea is a really great way to start out. And also there's like, like you'll find like, oh, these teas do not taste good together or some teas just are never going to taste good. Or um, so tea is a really great way to start out. Um, that's probably where I tell people to start. I drink a lot of tea. So when we're at the store and we're looking at the different teas and it's saying calming or yeah. it's going to do this, we should believe it for the most part. Obviously do some research, but you know how they kind of... Yeah, I mean, most of those, yes. I would say like if it's a calm tea, it's probably going to have lavender. It's probably right. going to have lemon balm, probably going to have chamomile. Yeah. Like most of like, like those things are going to have like a similar like herbal profile. But you can... You can for the, I've had people like on on Instagram be like, what do you think of this product? And I always say like teas are great. I don't want anybody to get mad at me, but like a lot of the trending, like if it's like a product that has like an herb in it, it, it might not have a functional dose in it. So it might be a waste of your money. Uh oh. So like if you're getting like chocolate with ashwagandha in it, right. probably not a big enough dose of ashwagandha to actually have an effect. Well, how do we know? Um, go to an herbalist. Yeah, that's like or learn or Google like what's a functional dose of ashwagandha. Right, and then 
make sure you know what's on that site. Make sure and also reputable you do want to and you do want to be like cautious of like some of these like where are these herbs grown like what's Ooh. the are they third party tested like what's the heavy metal like potentials wow. for it especially for like roots that are grown like in the ground. Because those are really going to absorb the soil, the stuff that's in the soil. How do you know? Do you go to a website? Is there something that you do? Um, to I'll usually, if I'm like, there's either, like, I'll, I either order my herbs through uh, a place that we have, like, in Southern Oregon called Oshala Farms. They've got really great herbs. And I know that and they're, like, local? all organic. And, okay. like, um, yeah, it's local. But if you go to a herb shop, they should have good quality herbs there. Oftentimes you can ask like if they have like the tests to see like what the levels are, but sometimes they won't. Um, so that's why like just doing just doing some research online. Um, if it's it's like as long as they're if they're weird about if they don't have the third party testing, they'll just tell you. But if they do and they don't want to show it to you, that's probably a red flag. Got it. OK. <laughs> What's something simple yet very effective you know, the one thing someone can do to help manage their stress. Boundaries. Not Ooh. easy, but it's kind of simple. Boundaries. Like um, if you're finding yourself feel spread thin, it's most likely because there's probably some places that you're not, that you're, you know, people pleasing or oh. which. Is Don't big get one. me started. We <laughs> could have a whole episode on that. Yeah. Um, so, um, so where can you, where can you prioritize your mental and emotional health? Um, you know, maybe it's not having your phone in the bed with you at night. Maybe it's, you know, oh, I'm not going to answer emails after 8 p.m. at night. Maybe right. it's seeing if you're, if you're being given more work at work than what feels feasible, seeing where you can outsource if there's a possibility for that. Right. Um, I think, I think looking at where you can outsource is a really great tool. Mm -hmm. It's not always easy, but, um, look at where, like, are you drinking a lot of alcohol? Mm -hmm. Are you, cause alcohol is like gasoline on a fire for people who have anxiety. The nervous system doesn't really, it's oh. a, it's, it's a suppressant. So it actually like, it's, it's such a personal decision for people, but a lot of people find that if they cut out alcohol, things shift. Really? So that's a big one. If you're if you're if you're if de finding you're de-stressing with alcohol, it's it's actually harder. It's actually probably causing more problems. Okay. Well, sorry to rain on everybody. <laughs> parade, that's not but to say that you <laughs> toss the alcohol out. It's not to say you shouldn't couldn't shouldn't or couldn't enjoy a drink. It's just like looking, uh, getting curious about your relationship with alcohol. I yeah. think that I always tell people getting curious is really beautiful because it comes from without judgment. Mm. Cause the moment you start to judge yourself, then that's when you get into the shadow and you're going to like shut that down and you're not going to look at where you're like, Oh, maybe I have like, maybe I am using this to cope and maybe that's not the best. What can I, what can I do to like cut it down to like one a right. week or a couple, you know? Right. Okay. We need a part two. Okay. You apparently have to leave because you're booked and busy. <laughs> no, but seriously, where can people find you? How can somebody explore, yeah. you know, your coaching work yeah. and be in your orbit? Yeah, I am. Um, so I'm I'm the untamed herbalist on all platforms. <laughs> I love that. Um, I, I went with that because I actually rebranded like three years ago. And I was like, because I'm untamed, so I can do whatever the f want. Let's go. <laughs> yes. yes. Because I spent my whole life being tamed yeah. and I'm not doing that anymore. Nope. <laughs> nope. I love that. Um, and then um, the untamed herbalist.com. Shout out to corporate companies if you want to hire me to come in and do a talk about nervous system and um, and beating burnout and how to Ooh. support your team and your employees. Um, so that they can self-regulate and be more productive and have better co company morale. Like that's something I'm really focusing on right now because I think it's really big. Um, and a lot of people I talk to in the corporate world are so fried out right now. Oh yeah, it's done. Everyone's it's done. Exhausted. Everyone's Everyone, exhausted. Everyone Late hates stage everybody. capitalism, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait, so are your coaching sessions also virtual just for I do some everything okay virtually. so virtual yeah. in person do it over in FaceTime or Zoom um even people in Portland I do right I do over over Zoom it works okay. really really well and the re somebody asked me recently in Portland like oh well 
would you meet me somewhere? And I'm like, you know what? I actually, I've been doing this for a really long time. I've worked with people all over the world. So it's not even like, even if I had a client in Qatar for a while. Got it. I like doing it virtually because people are in their own safe space. Right. And that makes room for them to be able to go deeper. Makes sense. Yeah. For sure. So yeah, yeah all types of possibilities. Yes. yes. And I will, you know, be talking to you about working through my shadow. Yes, and, uh, I got you, girl. Working with other humans. <laughs> I'm kidding. But thank you so much, Amr. We need a part you. two. Yes, I'd love to come back. Okay. <laughs>